Second Thessalonians 2. Make sure the mic is on. It is. Now how it's on. Check, 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 check. Ah, what's going on, everybody? So glad you decided to join us on this beautiful day as we continue our study in the book of Second Thessalonians. Shorter chapter today consisting of just 17 verses, but as always, a lot to go over. Let's kick this one off. This is the Bible Vlog. In this chapter, Paul speaks about something called the great apostasy. Now, apostasy is really just a fancy word for the falling away or turning your back on God. But from what Paul writes here, it indicates that in the future, many people will completely abandon their faith or consider it almost righteous to have nothing to do with God. Now, look at how Paul describes this as well as a specific figure who is yet to be revealed in verses 3 through 4. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, now pause everything for one moment. Who is this son of perdition? Also, what does perdition mean? Well, glad you asked. So perdition means, according to the dictionary, a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unpenitent person passes after death. Well, that sounds nice. Now, this guy, whomever he is, is being referred to as the son of that. So that can't be good. Well, the person being described here is what the Apostle John referred to in his letters as the Antichrist. Now, there can be some confusion here because the Bible also describes a spirit of Antichrist. So the difference is that the Antichrist is a specific individual who is yet to be revealed. And the spirit of Antichrist is a demonic type of influence that has worked and still works through people for the devil's plans. So to give an example, there have been multiple rulers throughout time who exhibited the spirit of Antichrist. In fact, even in Jewish history, it's full of examples of guys like this. Atticus Epiphanes, who lived in about 167 BC, was an incredibly evil monarch, and he actually desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. You can read all about it in Daniel chapter 11. Then you had other rulers, such as Gaius Galiga and Domedon, who sought to be seen as divine. So this corrupting type of political power will also mark this final man of sin, or what we would call the Antichrist. Okay, let's read a little bit more about this. Look at verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they also may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the Antichrist, whomever this guy is, is going to have power and be able to perform signs and lying wonders. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of magic show he's going to perform, but this guy, by demonic power, is going to do some impossible things that are going to cause people to believe in him. See, just as God energizes the gifts of the Spirit, Satan is going to empower this figure, this guy, to produce compelling but deceptive signs and lying wonders. So this actually brings up an important point, which is this. Not every miracle comes from God. Now that's important to know. The devil does have power, even though it's limited, but if he can use it in a way to deceive people, then he will. Think back for a moment in the Old Testament when Moses was sent to deliver the children of Israel from Pharaoh. Now, the Bible says that Moses threw his walking stick on the ground and it becomes a snake, but the crazy thing is that the Bible says that Pharaoh's magicians did the exact same thing. Now, both are miraculous, but one is from God and one is from the devil. So does that mean that the devil can just match God's power? Well, no, not at all. In fact, the Bible says that Moses' snake or his staff that he threw on the ground proceeded to eat the other ones after they were thrown down. And of course, as the plagues were unleashed on Egypt, none of Pharaoh's magicians were able to duplicate it. The point is that, of course, God is greater, but Satan does have power to try and show a counterfeit miracle. Okay, one last verse to look at. Look at verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hold on to the traditions you were taught. You know, if there's ever a time that that passage is true, it sure is today. As culture changes around us and the world moves more and more towards this falling away that the Bible describes, we are to stand fast and to hold on what we've been taught, both by the word and the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's all always a balance of the Spirit and the Word. And the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. When you hold on to that, nothing will move your faith because it's planted on a solid foundation. All right, everyone, that's it for us today with chapter two of 2 Thessalonians. Interesting stuff in these chapters, isn't it? We still have one more to go before wrapping up this book. Chapter three is tomorrow. Make sure you do not miss it. Well, thank you as always for being here. Hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you find yourself watching this from. More than anything, know that God loves you so much. He sent Jesus to this planet for you. Yep, you. 
loves you, and the best decision you will ever make is to follow him and give your life to him. Change mine, and it will change yours. All right, you all be good and get out of here. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh,